Hey, Bonnie, Catherine's here. Thank you. Okay, it's three o'clock. I want to welcome you to uh, the Gate Equity webinar series. Today, we're talking about equitably expanding career and technical education. You might know it by CTE. This meeting is being recorded live on YouTube. We're going to drop the PowerPoint in the chat for you, but it is also posted on OSPI's webpage on the Gate Equity webinar page if you want to follow along. All of our webinars have closed captioning available. If you're having trouble launching the closed captioning, please say so in the chat. Megan Holmgren will try and help you. If you aren't already aware, OSPI has a YouTube channel where we post all of our recordings. If you can't make it to one of our webinars or want to share a recording, all you have to do is subscribe to the OSPI channel and by clicking the little bell, you'll get alerts each time we post a new video. We love to see our listeners get clock hours for joining us. Partial clock hours are available if you can only make one of the webinars or if you have to drop off early. Um, I think the link will be in the chat. If you've registered with PD Enroller, all you have to do is join us for the live webinars and complete the PD Enroller evaluation. And the awesome Ronnie Larson will verify your attendance and you should have a confirmation back by early next week. I just wanna let you know that we're skipping breakout rooms today in favor of Q&A. We have a lot to cover and wanna be able to answer any questions you might have. Uh, just a reminder that we like it. If you rename yourself, it's helpful to know who's in the audience. And again, if you need help, Megan Holmgren will uh, be able to help you. This webinar is brought to you through the Office of System and School Improvement within the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. At OSPI, we believe each student needs to be prepared for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civic engagement. We are driven to transform K-12 education to a system that is centered on closing opportunity gaps and is characterized by high expectations for all students and educators. We believe we'll achieve this by developing equity-based policies and supports that empower educators, families, and communities. And we aspire to have all of our work be driven by our values, ensuring equity, collaboration and service, achieving excellence through continuous improvement, and focusing on the whole child. The Gate Equity webinar was created with the purpose of highlighting practices that increase access to education and ultimately to graduation. Through our webinars, we are striving to go beyond equality. We want to acknowledge historical contexts and engage our students, families, and communities as partners in decision-making because they possess the strengths and cultural knowledge that will transform our schools. Uh, this webinar is broadcasting from the lands of the Squaxin Island tribe. Um, and I would like to acknowledge the indigenous people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial and who still inhabit the area today. The Squaxin Island tribe was created by combining seven bands of indigenous peoples from throughout South Puget Sound. These seven bands were originally placed on a reservation in 1854 called Squaxin Island near Thurston and Mason counties. Olympia sits on the shores of Bud Inlet. Bud Inlet was once known as, and I don't know if I'm gonna say this right, Stichas, titled after the band of people who lived there since time immemorial. We ask the participants of this meeting to also honor the traditional lands on which each of you are located today. If you know which traditional lands you're on, please share it in the chat. And if you're interested in, in learning more about land, acknowledge, uh, land acknowledgements, it's best practice for districts to engage in tribal consultation with the tribes nearest their school district. In our office, we've created a cultural acknowledgement that helps ground our work. We want to acknowledge the pain and trauma resulting from over 400 years of racism in the United States and against people of the African diaspora 
we stand with our communities of color during these unprecedented uh, Anyway, times. what I'm going to do here is, oops, uh, we stand with our communities of color during these unprecedented times of civil unrest, especially those who identify as and or are categorized as Black and or African American. We will continue to center our work in leading with racial equity. We want to offer a moment of silence and afterwards honor the space for people from communities of color to respond to this acknowledgement first. Then we invite allies and others to communicate their comments after. If you feel more comfortable, please use the chat box. We invite accountability and partnership and hope you'll support us as we continue to grow. Now we're gonna pause for one minute to reflect. Okay, we're gonna open the floor to our listeners from communities of color to respond to this acknowledgement first. Please unmute yourself or raise your hand and somebody will unmute you if you need help, but we'd like to hear from you if you would like to contribute. I know for me, it's difficult to speak out. So if you're like me and you would like to add something to the chat, we would we would um, thank you for honoring this time of reflection. Our objectives today will ask the question, why does it matter that we expand access to career and technical education for dual credit? OSPI CTE team will give an intro to career and technical education and we'll explore options for increasing access to dual credit for CTE. My name is Bonnie Zimmerman. My OSPI partners today are Catherine Mahoney, Assistant Director for Policy, Jason Boatwright, Dual Credit Program Supervisor, and Samantha Sanders, Assistant Director for CTE. D Doug Edmondson from Mead School District, he's the CTE Director, and Jessica Dempsey from Spokane Community Colleges will share their journey and partnership in expanding CTE for students. Megan Holmgren is with us to make sure everything runs smoothly. If you need something, you can let Megan know in the chat. We like to know who our audience is so that we can tailor our content to your needs. Um, we're gonna transition while you take the poll. In order for the poll to submit, you need to answer all the questions. So you might have to scroll to the bottom to find the last question. And um, while you tell us who you are, I want to introduce Catherine Mahoney, our Assistant Director of Policy at OSPI. Uh, Catherine, do you want to tell us why expanding access to CTE for dual credit matters? And how? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to see the results of the poll to understand um, who's joining us today. Um, we are here to talk about this main big idea, why expanding access to CTE for dual credit matters. My name is Catherine Mahoney. Could you go back one slide? Um, my name is Catherine Mahoney. Um, I am a lead for our dual credit policy here at OSPI. Uh, OSPI's focus on supporting dual credit expansion um, really means uh, three different things. One, building access to meaningful and actionable high school and beyond plans, uh, building access that is equitable to dual credit courses and opportunities for all students, and more flexibility in grad requirements to allow students to complete pathways that uh, best position them for what they uh, want to accomplish that first step after high school. Uh, an area that we believe we have the most need for growth in in order to meet those goals uh, is to increase dual credit opportunities for students um, inside of CTE courses and pathways. 
many of you uh, may be familiar uh, with kind of the, the proper noun CTE dual credit, formerly known as, as tech prep. Um, as a level set, I wanna be really clear, we're not talking only about what was formerly known as tech prep or that is called kind of, pro again, proper noun, all cap CTE dual credit. Um, we, we mean all types of, C of dual credit that CTE programs could be connected to and that students who are completing CTE programs of study could be connected to. That means concurrent enrollment options like Running Start, college and the high school. Uh, it also means exam-based dual credit options, um, mo most commonly around uh, advanced placement courses where a student completes a course and then takes an exam um, that then could be translated to uh, credit at, at a college level. Um, and then of course there's, there's CTE uh, dual credit proper noun, formerly known as tech prep. Um, that is that gives students an opportunity to access rigorous college level coursework and then they have a choice around transcribing that credit um, onto a college transcript at a later date. In order for us to get to where we're trying to go in terms of reimagining a high school experience that meets each student and their goals, um, we need growth in all those areas um, and all those different types of dual credit and each of those different types of dual credit offer different levels of support, um, access, opportunity that is aligned or, or differently based on what the student's needs are. So we really need growth in all those areas, a really solid program mix of options for students to um, help them meet their needs and their readiness. So the next slide. And the big question about why then, why CTE? Why is it that we think CTE dual credit is such an opportunity for our system? Um, there's a couple snips here of various different um, uh, assertions from lots of different places. Expanding CTE programming broadly and dual credit for CTE specifically really is our best bet to meet students' needs and Washington's economy's needs. So you can see in that first snip on the top left corner, almost 1 million working age adults in Washington, which is a little bit more than half, don't have the education or training to compete for living wage jobs in Washington. We have one of the strongest economies of all the states uh, in the United States. And the people that we uh, grow, create, support here uh, in Washington aren't accessing that opportunity as much as they could and should be. Um, we also see that our current graduates, graduates aren't accessing post-secondary credentials in a way that gives them access to living wage jobs at the rate that we'd expect or need. So that second one, is around dramatic growth needed in credit credential attainment by 20, age 26. We have a goal in Washington state of 70% uh, credential attainment for all of our graduates. And we have a long ways to go. And increasing dual credit in ways that make sense to students and their goals is a key strategy for getting there. And we're just not graduating all the students that we need to. Even though we've made really big gains in our graduation rates over time, we know that we're still leaving a lot of our students behind. Um, and too many of our students who don't graduate aren't doing any of that post-secondary work, as I said. And finally, employers and policymakers and educators, all of us agree that this is a problem. I mean, we see our vision statement there in the bottom left from OSPI and a snip from a bill that was passed two years ago, again, trying to, to direct energy and call to action around how, what our high school diploma needs to mean. Um, in order to really close those gaps between what students and graduates know and can do um, and what the labor market needs from them in order for us to continue to have a strong economy. Next slide, please. So the good news is, as we've been um, growing this sort of call to action, we've also been creating a, a good deal of um, conditions, policy conditions, expectations, interests that really lays a really great framework for why, why we should be looking to expand dual credit and specifically dual credit inside of these CTE areas. Uh, you are all likely aware of our graduation pathways bill. That SNP on the last um, slide was from that bill, House Bill 1599, that described a variety of graduation pathways as a graduation requirement in addition to credit requirements and to the high school and beyond plan requirements. This includes a CTE graduation pathway 
that of all the pathways is the most highly um, utility player <laughs> of all the pathways. Students who complete a CTE graduation pathway are prepared for post-secondary work at a college, a university, uh, a trade school. They're prepared for direct entry into the workforce, apprenticeship. Like they can, they have a wide range of choices because elements of that include an industry recognized credential and or dual credit inside of their CTE program area. But if we don't have enough dual credit opportunities inside of our CTE program areas, our students aren't gonna be able to access that pathway. There's also the dual credit pathway broadly that is really focused on students who are trying to transfer directly into um, a college or university in sort of a general education, liberal arts sort of way where it's ELA and math. We also in the state have dual credit as an accountability measure on our Washington School Improvement Framework. So we measure how much access our schools provide to dual credit as, as one of the signals of, of their effectiveness as, as a school. The governor is engaged in Career Connect Washington, his big sort of K-12 initiative over the last several years where employers are coming to the table and trying to create pathways to work experiences that include dual credit um, in order to, to close the skills gaps that we have um, in our state. You'll hear a little bit about Perkins reauthorization. This is the federal bill that um, identifies and provides supports for professional technical and career technical education, both in K-12 and post-secondary. We hear about those persistent skill gaps, the employer interest, the student demand um, is there. Uh, so we know this because we lose students by not being able to capture their imagination. Uh, and CTE, which is not just gears and grief, which we all know, it's also STEM fields, it's also medical fields, it's a wide range of things that we can use. Students are demanding that. And we know that our CTE program completers have more post-secondary success than their, than their cohorts that are not CTE. And you'll hear a little bit about that later as well. So that's my kind of sort of call to action and like all these things that are pointing and trying to support us in being able to radically and rapidly expand access to dual credit for CTE. So moving on, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Samantha Sanders from our Career and Technical Education Department, who's going to walk through in more detail some of these items. Thank you, Catherine. Um, unlike what this slide says, we are not going to do an introduction to all of Career and Technical Education because you guys would be here uh, a month with me. But what we are going to do is we're going to take that amazing um, overview of the current landscape for dual credit for CTE that Catherine spoke about. We're going to break it down a little bit. So hello, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here today as Catherine said, Samantha. I am um, privileged to have spent the last 12 years in Korean technical education as a classroom teacher in the building technology program area as a CTE director and as a high school vice principal. I've been at OSPI for almost three years now as the Assistant Director for CTE, and I am going to speak to you from a multifaceted lens today. Jason originally asked me to present on the why for CTE dual credit, and of course, I could not just stick with the why because we all know how fabulous CTE is, and there's a little bit more we want you to know about dual credit for CTE. I'm going to talk to you about the five W's and the H of a CTE dual credit, which is the formula for getting the complete story on the subject. Uh, while there's no way that I could give you the complete story, I am going to address each of those W's a little bit. And of course, to make it easier to follow, I am not going to follow the traditional order of who, what, when, why, and where in the training of all things education. I am going to start with the why. So, what does it do when you provide secondary students with essential academic and technical foundations that prepares them with necessary employability skills? It facilitates the development of a skilled workforce and ensures business and industry thrive and expand across the state. It also uh, um, supports Washingtonians in obtaining living wage careers through credentials of workplace value. That is a fairly strong why argument for CTE dual credit. Also, we know that national research indicates taking dual credit is connected to three different things, to, higher, uh, to high school rates and graduations, higher rates, increased college enrollment and degree completion, and also improved student self-confidence related to succeeding in college. So those early college credit opportunities for students in high school, they are going to get early attainment of their credentials, 
And those are gonna be in alignment with their high school and beyond plan and their post-secondary goals. You heard some OCI colleagues speak to the importance of that this morning in the one-on-one -on -one session. Hopefully you were able to take advantage of that. There's also support for students who may not have other routes to earn college credit. And they are gonna, CT dual credit is gonna better prepare students for post-secondary performance. At the end of the day, it's also a nice recruitment tool for our CTCs um, into their programs, more prepared students and interested students into those college programs. The who and the where for CT dual credit is fairly easy to wrap our heads around. Who? Any student that's in ninth to 12th grade. And where? Well, wherever they learn. They can be at their home campus, they can be at a school center, or they can be at the CTC itself. The what? You heard Catherine talk about um, articulation based dual credit. You heard her talk about exam based dual credit and a lot of the things that we have on this slide right here. Essentially, dual credit for CTE are courses taken at high school, skill center, or the college campus, which we previously mentioned, that provide students with the potential to earn college credit and high school credit to the same course. The content will integrate academic and technical skills to help prepare the advanced education and careers for students. It also includes a rigorous focused course of study. So courses fall within a career pathway and they lead to both degree and non-degree based industry recognized credentials or values. Also something that you heard Catherine mention. The first way we wanna think about the what in dual credit for CTE is the articulation and course based dual credit. This type includes three possible paths. The first is the CTE dual credit as a proper noun. You'll hear us at OSPI refer to it as a proper noun and is as a category. So also um, the old um, tech prep that we were familiar with. This, involved the develop this involves the development of articulation plans that uh, agreements set between the secondary schools and the community and technical college partners. We also have prof tech dual credit and college in the high school uh, also fall under this type. And you heard Catherine mention that um, college in the high school is a fabulous way to expand opportunities for dual credit and CTE. The second type is exam-based dual credit. An example of exam-based dual credit might be CTE SIP 110201, which is AP Computer Science Principles. Uh, we also call the course AP Computer Science, A. It's a CTE course that can earn a student exam-based dual credit should they take the AP exam as part of their study. Where is CTE dual credit? It's pretty much everywhere. Uh, when you heard the landscape layout of dual credit for uh, that Catherine mentioned, the forces are federal and local um, and statewide. Dual credit is showing up in all the places on both federal and state levels. Today, we're going to look at three of those really briefly. In our Perkins 5, a strengthening CTE for the 21st Century Act, rotherization, um, post secondary attainment is a huge component of that act. And a CTE dual credit shows up as one of those options. In ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, dual credit is one of CTE dual credit is one of the options in dual credit. And then we have state law, if you didn't know, that governs um, the um, pursuit of dual credit. And it's referred to as professional technical credit in that RCW. We're going to break those down just a tiny bit and give you a little more information. So in the Every Student Succeeds Act or the ESSA Act, Washington State measures dual credit access and accountability. There are seven areas. Proficiency growth, graduation, English language progress, regular attendance, ninth grade on track, and dual credit participation. So it is so important that it's one of the measurements that we use for our state um, in our state's response to the ESSA Act. You have lots of links in your um, chat right now. Thank you, Megan, for that. If you want to go look at that state plan and uh, see what those measurements are. Another way where it shows up, one of those cogwheels is in the Perkins 5. 
So Perkins 5 focuses on developing more fully the academic knowledge, technical and employability skills of secondary and post-secondary students. One of the things that is mentioned in there on the dual credit is that they lead to professional technical two-year degrees, two-year certificates of apprenticeships, and that they lead to employment or further education. The Perkins 5 Act is what enables federal dollars for CTE. If you're not familiar with that act and you'd like to read more, and it's quite lengthy, uh, we've given you the Perkins 5 uh, link as well. Additionally, in Perkins 5, a couple of things that are worth pointing out. Um, one of our um, program quality indicators, uh, there are eight indicators, and one of them, 5S1, is attained recognized post-secondary credential. So the association with the credit and Perkins has to do with the CT concentrators graduating from high school. You heard Catherine measure that. Attain post-secondary credit in the relevant career and technical education program or program of study. Earn to a dual credit or concurrent enrollment or another credit transfer agreement. We also see dual credit show up in our combined state plan with the workforce board. Secondary students have the ability to earn dual credit to meet both high school graduation requirements and the college within a professional technical pathway. And I've given you the section if you want to dive into that state plan and also the link. Now we get to the state law of the where. So we've been trying to grow dual credit in the state of Washington for a very long time. We've given you two specific RCWs that support that need for growth. 28B.50.531, which is dual high school and college credit for secondary career and technical courses. And then 28A.700.030, which is the definition of what counts for CTE. You will, if you're familiar with CTE programs in our state, you will know that preparatory courses require leads to IRC language and or dual credit, and that it is the goal and has been the goal of CTE to lead to those post-secondary experiences. Two more RCWs that are associated with dual credit for CTE, the high school and beyond plan and grad requirements, the 28A.230.090. This identifies the post-secondary goals and the CTE and dual credit courses that can help students meet those goals. So we know that CTE um, grad pathways is available for our students in the recent legislation. RCW 28A.655.250 is the grad pathways. So, Again, this morning, we heard about the importance of the high school and beyond plan and alignment with um, the students' post-secondary and career plans. Dual credit for dual credit sake isn't valuable, but we know that if we can help a student get to their end goal, dual credit is incredibly um, helpful. The last place that I'm gonna talk about where it shows up today is in the superintendent's vision and program. It is so important that we have four strategic goals and rigorous learner-centered options in every community that includes equitable access to dual credit is goal number two. So if all the other things that I talked about where it shows up weren't good enough, it shows up in the priorities of this agency, one of four priorities. And we've given you a link so you can go read those if you're not familiar with them. So as I round out this very brief, um, who, what, when, why, where, what, that means I didn't fill the W's in that. How do we do that? There's a lot of ways that we, uh, a lot of models we can create and a lot of partnerships that we, we can create to facilitate expanding dual credit for students through CTE. But what I wanna remind you about is that the CTE model itself um, that integrates lab shop experience, classroom instruction and theory, extended learning, and it's all brought together by our um, uh, CTSOs, is how we operate as a model. High school and beyond planning and strong partnerships are integral to CTE dual credit, uh, dual credit for CTE, not a just of a product now. And I am going to hand this off for a specific presentation of a how 
our um, guest presenters here that are going to talk about um, partnerships with Canon. Oh, just kidding. I'm going to hand this off to Jason because I saw his face pop up. I am ahead of schedule. Um, but a little bit later, you are going to hear about a very specific how um, for some of our partners on the east side. Awesome. Thank you, Samantha. That was that was fantastic. And I really love how you dive into each one of those and, and sort of just touch on the how just a little bit and, and the focus on you know, the high school and beyond plan and all of the wonderful work that we talked about this morning and all of the great work that everyone's doing out there. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jason Boright. I'm the program supervisor for dual credit here at OSBI. Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about exploring options for increasing access to dual credit career uh, for CTE. And then Sam, if you go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, before I introduce uh, our guest presenters today, is I want to talk just really sort of briefly about big picture things when we're talking about increasing access to dual credit and, and specifically for CTE and sort of the three keys that we think are best practices are, you know, exploring your data, looking at everything through an equity lens and really fo focusing in on your partnerships. When we talk about the data, what we're really looking at here is who are you serving and how are you serving them? And, and when we talk about the who, we're really talking about that equity lens of who in your students is participating in dual credit. Are you getting equal access by all student groups, whether that be race and ethnicity or if it by um, program groups such as English language learners or homeless versus non-homeless or low income students, are all of your students having the same rate of access to your dual credit? Um, part of that is also, does your master scheduling support your students' high school and beyond plan, right? As Samantha said, high school and beyond plans are extremely important, uh, especially when we talk about career and technical education. We want to make sure that the courses that we are offering, you know, are supporting those high school and beyond plans and really do align with what the students are hoping to do, um, either post-secondarily or career-wise right after high school. Um, we want to make sure, as Samantha said, no random acts of dual credit, right? While dual credit is fantastic, if it's not really serving a purpose for that student after high school, then there's really no need of doing it. So we need to make sure that all of those dual credit offerings and, and the choices that we're giving them are supporting those high school and beyond plans. Another thing about uh, the data and the high school and beyond plans is it's a great way of engaging students. One of the things that we saw from this morning's webinar, uh, if you were there, is that there was at Eisenhower High School in Yakima, there was a pretty significant disconnect between what the staff thought students wanted and what the students themselves wanted. And so that really gave them the ability to go in and, and to, to correct some of that and really address some of their inequities and, and making sure that their master scheduling and the courses that they're providing and the way that they're advertising those really did reach all of the students. And this goes to the equity piece again, making sure that all students have access to these dual credit options and making sure that all students have a quality high school and beyond plan and are able to access courses that are supporting those high school and beyond plans and, and what those students want to do post high school. And then the last key piece, and, and we're gonna see a lot of this in today's presentation, which is one of the reasons why I always invite these guys to talk, is partnerships, right? Don't try to do this alone, especially um, this is especially crucial when we talk about career and technical education, right? If we're giving high school students um, some pretty rigorous courses, but they don't really necessarily lead to anything that is being supported by industry or our local partners or the local colleges, then we're not really doing a service to those students. And so we want to make sure that, you know, we're working really closely with our college partners, with our local industry partners, our uh, advisory committees, and all of those. So we want to make sure that we are aligning um, that through way from high school to whatever's happening afterwards. One of the other things that's really important is when we talk about pipelines through high schools, we need to talk about how are we getting students to high school? Um, as Catherine and Sam both mentioned that, you know, for career and technical education, students can start those courses in ninth grade. And so when we're talking about sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, we want to make sure that they are having some uh, ex, uh, some experience and some lead up going into those college level courses. We don't want to just throw a student into a college level course and just hope that they that they do a sink or swim. So we want to make sure that we're also partnering with our juniors and middle highs and late in the elementary to make sure that we're giving 
students the opportunity to sort of prepare themselves to be able to take um, these dual credit courses. And so speaking of the importance of the high school and beyond plan, the next thing we're going to do is we want to take a poll really quick. And we did this this morning, but we want to do it again now as well, because we think it's really important is we want to explore how are you using your high school and beyond plan? So Sam, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. We're going to do a quick poll. And this poll is completely anonymous. So if the answer is no, that's okay. We just want to know. And we want to sort of, you know, start this conversation about, are you using your high school and, for, uh, high school and beyond plan to inform your student scheduling? And, and if you do, please, you know, if you want to make a comment in the chat, please feel free to do so. If you have an interesting story or if you have, you know, a trick or a tool that you're using to make those more meaningful, please go ahead and throw those in there. Okay, so we're seeing some results of those polls come in. Looks like about a quarter of the schools are saying yes. There are some folks that are marking NA, and I'm assuming that you're not you're in a school that's not up to where a high school plan, high school and beyond plan is required, or you're with another agency that doesn't um, participate in that particular activity. Okay, Sam, do we want to go ahead and go to the next slide? All right, so our key presenters today, as was introduced earlier, is, is we've got Doug with Mead School District, and we have Jessica from the Spokane Community Colleges, and I've asked them today to come in and, and talk and, and share some of their sort of revelations and, and some of the things that they've been doing and some of the partnerships that they've created um, over the past couple of years, I've had a chance to work with these guys and they've been doing some really fantastic work. So Doug and Jessica, please take it away. Thank you, Jason. So I'm Jessica Dempsey with the Community Colleges of Spokane, dual enrollment programs, so Running Start, College in the High School and CTE dual credit. I'm Doug Edmondson, I'm the CTE and Technology Director for the Mead School District. So next slide. So where Doug and I thought we would start is what was mentioned earlier, um, House Bill 1599. And most of you are familiar with it. And I'm gonna tell the story of how we kind of got things going with Mead School District. Um, when House Bill 1599 was coming out, Doug and I had been already talking about it, but then we went to a meeting with several of our colleagues and stakeholders, CTE directors and others who um, were concerned about the bill and what it had in it. And as we were at this meeting, Doug was across the table from me and we just started having this moment that we realized it wasn't what was in the bill, it was what wasn't said in it that would allow us to start creating things that align to high schools and to the college to help create pathways for students. So out of House Bill 1599, we created what our institution's calling Reading Start for Careers. And we aligned high school requirements for graduation. At that time, we aligned them to 16, was it Doug, of our programs. Sure. And as of today, we have 41 of our programs between Spokane Falls and SCC. And what also has come out of that, and we'll talk a little bit about, is as we were looking at these pathways we aligned for Reading Start for Careers for students, it gave us the opportunity to look backwards. So running start, as you know, is for 11th and 12th graders, but what could we do to set students up coming in eighth grade to ninth grade to 10th grade to 11th grade and on um, by doing articulations in the high school that would allow students to um, then go on and either go to a skill center apprenticeship running start for careers. Um, Doug, I don't know if you wanna chime in on how we kind of built it because we, we just had that moment that we kind of looked at each other and went, we're gonna do this. We did, and that was kind of the selling point, right? I mean, the, the hard part about this is, yes, I mean, we, we had the idea, but now we had to figure it out, and that's that's the piece. And because of the relationship that we have, the trust that was built in between both of us, we were able to then work with our superiors, my, my superintendent and Jessica's president, um, and the four of us sitting down to kind of work through what this meant. And for, for our district, the selling point was the articulations that we were going to develop based off of this, um, because myself and my superintendent knew that if we do this, we would essentially be losing FTE, right? Because running start, the college takes more of the FTE. But with the articulations, 
those kids that that choose to still stay at the high school or high schools have the opportunity to earn college credit without leaving. And so it's kind of a yes, this is this is great for our kids, great for our community to have a pathway um, uh, to their first future career. Um, but it also meant that we were able to work on those articulations and kind of set pieces up in our in our school as well. And so um, those are the pieces that the foundation that we had to set in order to make sure this was going to happen. Um, we had future ready counselors. That's what we call them in our district. Um, at each one of our high schools that also helped in this process. We vetted those first 16 courses through them um, so that then we can get the other counselors and teachers on board um, to make sure there was not any concerns there. Um, but once it started rolling, we realized that, gosh, this has such a huge impact. And as Jessica will speak to here, I'm sure in a second, is our community rallied behind us. Um, our trades community were doing backflips because we actually had a conduit directly into that instead of just talking about a four-year college pathway. Um, this was an option for all kids to have access to. It, it allowed us to start looking at areas where industry was coming to us and saying, and I'll give you the example, HVAC was a big one and our construction and our builders and contractors, and they were coming to us. Doug was getting calls, as my, many of you know, school districts, they're reaching out to you, they're reaching out to us as community colleges saying, we need, we need people, we're desperate, we need people. So what we did is when we started aligning the pathways, we started looking at industries that were reaching out to us asking for specific things. So some of the first ones we did was automotive, HVAC, and then those community partners, um, Sturm Heating and Air, who's a local one here in Spokane, um, they now serve on Doug's advisory board. We have partnered with them to create pathways that we never had before and relationships into the high schools. Um, Today, we had a big meeting with the Association of Builders and Contractors in our region, and we're pulling them in more and more. And, and that was with more school districts, right, Doug? We brought more school districts to the table to now have these industry partners at the table. Um, so we're sharing the wealth. It's going beyond just our pilot program that we started. Um, it's really growing. <laughs> Actually, it's really growing. <laughs> well, that was the thing, right, is how can we crack the door, right, based off of House Bill 1599? And what it wasn't saying, and instead of talking about, you know, the negatives, let's talk about the positives and let's work through what it could look like and what we can develop to help benefit our kids. And, and that's what we were able to do. And, and like Jessica said, we were able to crack that door open. Now the door is being burst open because we started out with 16, now we're at 41. We're continually revamping and fixing um, those pieces and expanding it and trying to make it um, more and more appealing to the masses um, because it's new and so we have to um, kind of get people rallied behind it and, and get the word out there so that then we can um, help with those pathways for those students. The, the conversation we had with industry today was about creating stackable credentials that a student can have that's specific to an industry and using CTE dual credit to do that. So while a student's in a high school, start looking at certifications we offer and ones you might not think that go together, but one from our diesel program that goes with our um, GIS program that goes with our networking design. And next thing you know, we have a pathway for one of our agriculture industry partners because that's what they needed. And so it's just us taking it and expanding it beyond what we ever thought we were going to do, right, Doug? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and like Jessica said too, right? Sharing the wealth, like that our biggest, excitement in this is getting out to the masses so that all kids can have this opportunity, not just the kids in the Mead School District or in our Spokane area. Um, it's because it, we do feel that this should be something in every single school district so that these kids can have access to it um, because it is a pathway, right? A lot of these students that um, uh, feel like they don't have a place, this could be the place that could help them exceed and excel down a pathway towards a career instead of just doing school. They actually get to do it for a reason and for a pathway that they're interested in and, and a way to get a certification or at least start their certification process. So, so we can probably go to the next slide. Um, so this, this shows, um, this is the marketing that we did. Um, we're the Sasquatch or the big, big feet, big foots. <laughs> um, 
and we we really started talking to students about how to put your big foot forward. And again, we did we have we're up to forty one programs. Um, each has a u- unique equivalency that we worked with the school district to do the alignment. Um, we have support on our campus for it as well as in the high school. So again, Doug has college college career counselors. I got the wrong name, didn't I, Doug? Um, career ready counselors that we worked with to make sure that we were aligning this specifically to what the high school needed. Um, We now work with multiple school districts doing this. Um, And I think the link just went in, right, for the equivalencies that it's on the Mead School District webpage. You can go out and look at them and we're constantly adding more. Probably go to the next slide. So, out of this, we also met with our local ESD and started talking about how do we get the word out. And one of the things that came to mind, and for those of you that are participating today um, and have been around a while, for years and years and years, it was called a Running Start Information Night. And that's what we did. Uh, I've, been, I've been in this 18 years and that's what you did. And then we started rethinking it and we thought, well, why can't it be a dual credit night? Why can't it be a dual enrollment night and not just have 11th graders and 10th graders that are thinking about it, but go all the way down into the eighth grade. So last year, um, we partnered with the ESD and did a dual credit night for our local ESD. And we also partnered with Eastern Washington University who we'd already been partnering with to do our information nights. That way students could see that if they wanted to do a pathway for nursing or they wanted to be a dental assistant in our pathway and then to go on to dental hygiene, that there was a four-year pathway for them as well. We didn't exclude the four-year just because we said CTE. We wanted to go all the way across the board and have students see all of their, their options. So this year, we actually, with almost all of our school district, partnered and did what we call the dual credit information night. And we represented college and the high school, CTE dual credit, running start, AP, um, the skills centers that came, we invited them to the, to the events. So it was a broader look at what pathways students could do. I don't know if Doug yeah, has anything that. Cool. So then, um, I guess we can go to the next slide, huh, Doug? Yeah, sorry, I thought somebody was gonna say something. Uh, uh-huh. All I was gonna say to that was, and they've done such a great job with it that it has, created just you know one of the opportunities for all of our students right that's that's the kind of language we're trying to use in our district is um, just creating options um, because for too many years it was just about running start and so when when people hear a running start night they're like well i'm not a running start kid i'm not going to show up mm-hmm. um, or there's no way i'd ever be a running start person so why do i need to pay attention to it now when we kind of lump it in as a dual credit night or rebrand it as a dual credit night now we, we've noticed that more and more kids and families are, are joining those nights because it is more open and accessible, what feels accessible to all, instead of just the elite that can do running start. And so um, it's, it's been very inclusive and has allowed for, like I said, more options for our kids to be connected. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so as Doug was saying this, as a result, um, Students and exper- students and parents have come to us. We've we've heard it even at the information nights or at events we're doing. Um, it's provided clarity and transparency around all of the options. Um, many schools are great at sharing all the options, but I don't think families knew what all the options were um, and what they were. We gave definitions. We explained it at our at our events. Eastern Washington University does a great job of explaining college and the high school and what that looks like. Um, We talk a lot about CTE dual credit, and then we also talk about um, other options, skill center. And so students could really have that expanded experience of what that looks like. The other thing, um, we, we created more options as we talked about and more opportunities. And what opportunities have been coming out of this, like we said previously, is we, we've been able to go backwards, <laughs> call it the backwards effect of running start, and really look at those pathways and where we can work in the schools to build articulation that align. As you were saying earlier, don't do a credit for credit's sake. What's the, the value of it that could come out with a student um, and help them? And then student enrollments across our programs have absolutely increased. It, um, 
not just in Ready Start for Careers, but we have true conversations about the students when they're coming in with them about, do you realize you can stay at the high school and do this? Um, do you realize you don't have to be here? The Skill Center offers that. If you want to slow down and have culinary in a different experience, Mead School District has that as a great opportunity, as well as the Skill Center, as well as us. And I, I think it's helping families make better decisions about the way the opportunities for their kiddos. <laughs> yeah, we've been able to find what's best for those kids, right? And and apply that to it. Uh, and and the, the other great thing too is it has also changed in our district. Um, um, no disrespect to the community college, but in our district, community college wasn't seen as a place to go, right? You're supposed to go to four-year college, that's it. And, um, and community college was, well, it's because you couldn't get into a four-year, so now let's go to a two-year. And we've worked really hard the last several years to change that narrative. Um, and it has changed the amount of enrollment that SEC has gotten from our district. It's exploded the last couple of years, which is exactly how it should be. Um, because once again, it, there are great opportunities for kids at our community college. It's not because you couldn't make it to a four-year. It's because this is a pathway that you chose to go down and it's a great pathway to go down. And so, I mean, when I look at that list, that's my favorite thing. Looking at this list of, you know, anything from, um, if you want to go be an accountant, no problem, go down there. You can go do running start for careers and through that, or my favorite, you want to go be a welder, um, go down to do the running start for careers through SEC. You can be a welder. You can get your high school certification, your classes done, and also receive your welding certificate. Yes, there may be a bit of a ping pong, meaning that you are down there at SEC taking those courses, but you may have to take an online course to cover that. That, um, that US history it isn't offered, right? Um, so there, we we do know that, and that's something for all of you to understand that there. This is not perfect. There will be some times where kids do have to take an online course because they're missing a high school required class that isn't offered or, or they weren't able to get that credit through SEC. And so great, they may have to come back to the high school or take an online course to get that. Um, there will be some fillers that need to occur. Hey, Doug, we got a question. I want to go ahead and a ask it right now because I think it lends itself really uh, well to what you're speaking of. And the question was, as a small school, smaller school district, what are some ways in which you have addressed the cost of offering more IRCs in high school? Um, I mean, that's a great question. And I don't know how to answer that specifically. Um, I don't know. Um, I guess I guess I would ask a question directly. What are I guess what are some of those concerns in the small school that that you have? And mm -hmm. let's unpack that a little bit more. Can we allow Renee to speak? Yeah, I'm Renee, so if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question and elaborate, that'd be fantastic. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, in, in um, Promoting industry recognized credentials across the state often, I, I hear, especially from smaller districts, that the cost of offering certifications is a barrier um, for students. Um, some certification tests can run um, you know, $25, while others can be several hundred dollars to take a certification test. Um, sometimes the schools are, uh, have funding through various sources of grants or um, through uh, business partnerships to cover those costs, almost like a, like a scholarship. Um, others are paid for the students, some are paid by the, by the district. So there's a lot of variety out there, but more and more you hear from smaller districts that it's difficult to either pay for a site license, for a certification, um, to, to offer to many students or the individual per student cost is, is, is too much of a barrier. So I just wondered if you came across that challenge in your district and if you found ways to um, overcome that. 
Yeah, so what, thank you for, for elaborating on that, that, that helps. Um, and so, yeah, for us, what we've done is, is really just worked with our, our trades community. And so as an example, Association of Builders and Contractors, if there were tests that our kids were going to take, I would approach them. And we had a few kids that couldn't afford it. Um, I would approach them and say, hey, um, would you guys like to sponsor these kids? Um, that is, I mean, that is the benefit of us being a larger school district and within um, a large community, a trades community. Um, but that's what I would suggest is working with those. I think that that's a great way to build um, yeah. a bank of dollars, if you will. Even our small school districts, so Doug, you, you and I, um, I'll give examples. So I usually go out and meet with a smaller school district, see what it is specific that they want to their building. What is it we can build for them? So I recently was at Garfield Loose High School and three of my automotive instructors went with me and, and our hydraulics. And we went down and looked at what we could offer them. Then we turned around and met, sent an email to our national organization for automotive and said, how about adopting a school? It's, it's something they want to do. And we tied it into our independent builders, or not builders, independent auto dealers. Um, and so that's what Doug and I have started doing is looking for the industry, because if they want us to send them people to fill the need, then, then they are more than willing right now to give back. Well, and it's like, it's like, as an example, like one of the, one of the kind of low hanging fruit um, certifications is um, OSHA 10 certification, right? Well, I'm not going to go get my teachers certified in OSHA 10 so that they can then um, teach their kids necessarily. And so, but working with ABC, they're willing to now bring one of their certified OSHA 10 um, uh, folks to our district and our classrooms and then train those kids up so that they can get that OSHA 10 certification. But I was also thinking too, Jessica is like, McGregor might, might be right. a perfect example for this, right? Like mm -hmm. I, would, I would lean on McGregor heavily and say, hey, we've got a small school that is in your area that you kind of oversee since McGregor's all over our state and say, we need to create a bank of, you know, of money so that these kids can go get that certification and, and, and go down that route. Um, and that's McGregor Agriculture, who actually is heavily in our state as well as all over the country. Um, and they've come to us and said, we want to partner with schools and how do we get in their buildings and how do we economically support them too? Because if we're going to ask for it, we have to step up and be willing to help from that part as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'd suggest, Renee. I mean, I, I, and I would say too, I know what we're meeting with McGregor is tomorrow. tomorrow. And so that's something that we can bring up in our conversation as well with them and say, hey, how can, how can we help these local smaller districts uh, that need some support for these certifications and see what they can do and just start that conversation for all of us. Yeah. I think what's helped smaller school districts, again, I've worked with a lot of them, is um, if you've ever heard Gordon Ramsay when he's on the cookie show and he's like, you don't need 30 things on the menu, you need five. I, I think it's looking at whether you're a big school district or a small, five, find the five or the two or the one and start there, let us build it. Whether you're building it with us here at Spokane or Yakima with Carrie or Keeley at CBC, start small and build it and then expand on that. Because what we found, right, Doug, is that we started with having an automotive conversation next thing we know we have hydraulics and we have CAD and we have these other departments we're pulling in now um, that are going to allow us to expand the articulation and i would also say you know reach out to us so that we can get you guys involved in some of our other conversations that we're having and invite you to the table so then you can speak to those pieces um, because jessica does a great job speaking for the small schools but that's not i don't have enough information for myself in those small schools to, to be able to support that and so I guess the more knowledge that we have and the more uh, support we can try to funnel that direction as well. Um, can I address another um, question about from Lynn in regards to um, does the musical district offer regular CTE trades classes in the high school? So um, about geez, eight or nine years ago, we actually collapsed all of our shop classes, um, our woods and our metal shop class. We've never had ag in our area, which is uh, a shame. That's something I actually need to work on. Um, but um, in the past, well, to answer the question directly, yes. So starting this fall, we will have a 
We've been working with the Home Builders Association, Spokane Home Builders Association, and at the national level, and we are developing curriculum for um, our seventh and eighth grade courses to open back up our shop classes, which has actually created enough um, upward pressure where now my high school classes or high school teachers are now talking about restarting um, our, our shop classes, though we won't call them shop classes. We will call them construction and manufacturing classes um, because I want those classes not to just be a woods class teaching, you know, how to build a birdhouse. Um, I want them to learn how to frame up a wall and run um, electrical and learn how to weld. And so to me, those are all part of that class. And so that's the piece that we're starting to work on. Um, but yes, as far as the last part of your question, articulating with the college, um, I've been working very, very closely with Jessica for the past year, if not more. Uh, actually, more than that, because it took forever to get our um, our biomed articulated. Um, but yeah, we have um, several classes right now, and we're constantly working on more um, to get those articulation agreements in place. Because to me, that's the important piece, right? Those, this all is important. But if a kid can stay in class and stay in our school and get college credit, I'm going to fight for that, and it doesn't cost them anything. That's a piece that we've been pushing pretty hard on. Um, and so, so yeah, we have several classes set up for for this upcoming fall and we'll continue to work on adding more to that list i think the next slide is q a right jason or samantha or... yeah that's right so we yeah we're actually technically into the q a session now so mm -hmm. sam if you want to go ahead and and there was one other question that was asked a little earlier and and so i'd like to come back to it and, and the question was were there and this is referring back to when you guys were talking about 1599 um, were there any policy or funding structures related to the House bill that did, in fact, pose a challenge? And if so, how did you overcome it? Um, read it again, because I was thinking I don't remember those kinds of challenges. Sure. So were there any policy or funding structures related to the House bill that did, in fact, pose a challenge? Because you guys saw it as an opportunity, right? And you sort of jumped on it with, in both feet. But... You know, were there any challenges and how did you overcome those? I think the biggest one Doug talked about earlier was having my president and his superintendent meet and we talked through the FTE, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah the biggest challenge was the mind shift, right. right? Creating the mind shift and telling the story. Um, because, I mean, I had to work on my, and he was a brand new superintendent, had to work on my brand new superintendent coming in after going through a $16 million budget cut. Um, and so we had to work through what that looked like, but I just kept talking about what is best for kids and all of our kids having this opportunity. Yes, we'll lose some FTE, but we may have lost it anyways, uh, because if we don't create pathways like this, we could have kids drop out of school and we don't want that. We want to make sure we have a pathway for all of our kids. And so, um, uh, and it's running start at the end of the day, it's running start. So the funding works exactly the same way. Uh, a model that people know, right? It wasn't like we created this new model. It's like, no, no, it, it is running start. So that that percentage, that FTE um, percentage is the same way it's always been with running start. So it's no different. What we did have to think about though, um, and it probably doesn't exactly answer the question and it wasn't around that was, if we were putting students in the trades, how do we make sure that what they need is covered as well? So a student going into culinary, the knife sets, you know, $500 and the jackets, so we actually sought out support from our industry partners again. And I've worked with uh, the foundation of the community college of Spokane has stepped up and we have a whole campaign around it now. And Doug and I are constantly looking at ways to support students so that when they decide that's what they want to do, we don't want the economics of being in the program to pay the fees or buy the tools to become an issue either. And with Jason's support, right, having a grant that we could apply for as well to help for some of those funding pieces for materials right. is, is something that we were able to apply for and able to get because of what we had created kind of fit directly in to that grant. And that was that was beneficial and will be beneficial moving forward um, so we can buy supplies for students. I got a text one day from my supervisor saying, um, a truck just dropped off a bunch of tools. Where would you like me to put them? I didn't even know they were coming. And it was all these brand new tools, boxes of tools, and all these things that now I have set aside for this program. Yeah. 
So just as a really quick follow up really quickly. So the, the grant that Doug was just mentioning is this year, uh, OSPI created a new grant and, and it was refer and it's called the, the Building Equitable Sustainable um, Dual Credit Expansion Grant. And what we tried to do this year is we wanted to move away just from paying student costs, but to actually you know, ask schools and districts to examine their data, take a look at where their gaps and their, their deficiencies were and to come up with plans on how can they, they build their programs and, we, and into the, the grant and the allowable activities was expansion of CTE specifically because we do recognize it as being such an important uh, you know, part of a student's high school education. And so we wanted to make sure to give schools that opportunity. So after schools you know, explored their data, they came up with some proposals on how to do that. And, and so we were able to give them some, some funding. And so we're really excited to see some of the work that, that's coming out of um, Mead and, and Spokane with this, with this grant. Thank you, Doug and Jessica and Jason, but we're still here for questions. I know you're probably mulling over everything that you heard. If you have any questions, go ahead and either raise your hand and we'll call on you, unmute yourself or put them in the chat and we'll read them off. But we want to hear from you. Um, what are you thinking? What would you like to know? Anything, uh, Doug and Jessica, that you want to uh, share that we didn't um, think we'd have time for? That you, both of you, scratching your heads. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I would just, I would tell you, you know, the one thing that Jessica and I um, uh, do a good job at is when somebody tells us no, we don't just like get upset and and mope around. We say, uh, okay, thanks. We'll give us some time because we're going to come back around and find a different entry point. And so that's a suggestion for all of you is don't, don't just take no for an answer. You can take that no, re-strategize um, what you need to do and find another entry point. Because uh, uh, too many times we, we get stuck in that realm of like, oh, they said, no, I can't do it. Well, no, that's not true. Just you gotta tell a story a different way and, um, and find those entry points. Because that's, that's one place, place that we've had to do a lot of is, is work on that, especially when we're talking about um, uh, sometimes the minutia of the educational system and, and how we can fight through some of that. But once we got our industry partners on board and started meeting with them, it's kind of like you can't stop this train from moving down the track. So it's moving. So we need to jump on board with us um, because because it's rolling now, which is great. So. When you were saying that, Doug, it made me think I, I met with all of my departments and had conversations as well because um, high schools aren't used to wait lists. So if a, we have a wait list for automotive and a student can't get in right away, what kinds of things could we be doing with that student? So their first quarter, maybe they're taking that U.S. history and that political science, things they need um, to that were not part of that automotive pathway. Um, so we were having to get creative and, and think about as the students were coming in. And then some other positives that came out of it is our culinary program. It actually offset the first quarter where students are coming in either through articulation or coming in with, with different credits that we're creating a pipeline now into that program that Doug and I are actually meeting with our culinary folks next week to have a conversation about that whole piece, right? Because now we're articulating with me. We're doing running start for careers and the program is the one accepting them. So what does that look like and how we can create some different pathways on my own campus um, with the pipeline that's coming in? I'd also say too, like get, get the crazies together, right? So like <laughs> Jessica and I are, are, <laughs> are the crazies and by, by getting us together, we can find ways to navigate that piece. So, so you know, you got to get some people in your corner. Um, uh, to help you move through this process. Uh, don't do it alone. Feel free to reach out to both of us. We're more than willing to help because for me, this is what feeds me is knowing that I can help others and help outside of our area um, because we just kind of do truly believe that this is what's best for kids and having these options for kids. And so if there's a way that we can help, help you navigate. Um, we've talked to ESDs in the past, other ESDs across the state, just to try to help them develop this and get this piece going. Um, but feel free to reach out for sure. Um, so 
Uh, Doug and Jessica, there is a question. Do you have ideas how to link students identify career goals, their high school and beyond plan to dual credit or CTE classes if they are not offered within our school or community college? So if their pathway is not represented and they right. don't have a connection within their school or their community colleges, is that the question? Yes. Correctly? Yes. Um, so my, my first answer is you can do Running Start anywhere in the state. You don't have to stay where you are geographically. So if I, and it can be online. So if I, um, let's use veterinary assistant, we don't offer that here, but but Yakima does. So I'm going to recommend the student maybe have a conversation and see if they could do it remotely. Um, that's one of the ways, and we also in CTE dual credit, if I don't offer it, then I'm going to recommend a, a, maybe it's CBC or Walla Walla or wherever that they can go to to get that filled. So maybe they have a CTE teacher or a program they want in their building that we don't offer. I'm definitely going to do a handoff to a, another community college partner that can help them. That's a good answer. Um, I'm not seeing very many more questions at this point. Uh, any, any, Sam, uh, Catherine, Jason, anything you want to add? Um, yeah, thinking of running start remotely out of area. Yeah, that's, that's good to know. I think that that was probably, um, an, uh, something that not all of us were aware of. Well, and think about how many programs moved online last year. Yes. At the colleges. Now, mm -hmm. there's so many opportunities for students we never had before. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and all of you at the, at the community colleges have a great connection across the state. I know you guys, I think you said you meet monthly. Right. So it's a great, we do meet quite often, yes. Yeah, so it's a great conversation to be able to say, gosh, hey, I, I had this came to me, I know I don't offer it. And so you know exactly who to go to and how to connect those people. I mean, that's that's part of it, right? Is having people in your corner that can be your connectors and take you to people. Um, so that was a good suggestion. Yeah, I, I think that what I would love for participants to take away from this conversation is that there are a lot of options and you can't um, pursue those options without a conversation. And a partnership so start asking the questions and someone someone if they're not the right person will hopefully redirect you but someone has to reach out first and uh, see what's available what can we do here's what i need here's what i think i need i don't know what i need um so whether you're reaching out to us the people on this um webinar whether you're reaching out to someone you might know at the community college or that you've googled um or you're reaching out to um you know, a partner in industry, you just have to do it. Just have to do it, or you're never going to get a model that works for you and your students. Thank you, Sam. Well, I think there's never any harm in, in um, wrapping up early and give everybody the gift of time. Um, we, I'm sorry, somebody has a question? Yep, there's another one in chat, I think. Oh, okay, great. As far as high school and beyond planning, if a student doesn't know what they want to do, what do you re recommend in terms of dual credit participation? I mean, to answer that quickly, it'd be get them involved in something, right? Get them down a pathway because I thought I was going to be a history teacher. And then I went to college and I started falling asleep in those history classes and realized I wasn't going to be a history teacher. So um, you don't know, you don't know what you don't know, right? So go down a pathway. If that pathway is not right for you, then be able to switch over to another one. That's what's great about the, the running start for careers is, is students are still able to do that, even though they've designated a pathway, they can still hop over and say, gosh, you know what? I thought this was my pathway, but it's not. So I think the most important thing is getting kids down the road, whatever that road may be. Um, there are in life, there are many forks in the road and, and pick a path and see how that works. And if it does, then there'll be another fork somewhere else down the road. So. Well, and I've had conversations with students and a lot of times I think we ask them, what do you wanna do? And I'll say to a student, what do you know you don't wanna do? 
and let's start their work backwards and they'll say oh gosh i i can't stand blood or i don't want to get dirty um so then you can work backwards from that right like okay we'll rule out nursing then or and but they still want to do medical all of a sudden they're like but i still like medical so then maybe it's our medical assisting in the office part not medical assisting in the doctor's office part um and, and Samantha's absolutely right. Those career interest surveys, uh, our district uses Zello. Um, that's been great for our kids. And so that, that helps our, our counselors and our future ready counselors to know how to talk to those kids once they've done those interest surveys. Mm -hmm. uh, so all, yep, all those are great suggestions. I also think there's a, a, a misconception about the level of granularity about what a post-secondary goal is and what a career interest is. We're talking about adolescents. I have two of them in my household right now that during this webinar, I've considered exiting from my household because of their adolescent <laughs> behaviors. Um, and I know one of them is really crystal clear, like with some pretty clear precision. Um, and another one's not at all. But there's broad concept areas. It's the same thing around graduation pathway selection. Um, it, if a, you have a student who's interested in a medical type field, if you can get past this whole like blood and you know, those other pieces I, that you mentioned, Jessica, mm -hmm. um, there's actually, there's professional technical pathways, going to a two-year college or a trade school, there's a STEM pathway, a four-year pathway, there's a work pathway, an apprenticeship pathway. Like it, it doesn't, it's not nearly as narrow as we sometimes as adults think we want or, or think that the expectation is. Um, there are often much broader categories that allow a lot of transferability and transferable skills um, that allow students to kind of get those really foundational ideas and concepts down. So I would also continue to encourage us to, you know, follow the law around the high school and beyond plan, do those career interest surveys early, do them again and again, Make sure that students are getting using their high school and beyond plans as a way to have agency and voice around what happens to them when they're in high school and what options they want to have available to them later after. And then I'll go on mute. <laughs> I think it's okay for them to start anywhere. My my first career, I actually have a degree in forestry and recreation management and work for the US Forest Service. That isn't what I'm doing now, but the skills I learned by doing those those degrees and working through those things um, help me in my job. It, it's, I think they just have to start somewhere. Well, and I would also add too, what's, what's very important, important is the um, advisory groups for our teachers, right? So that's part of the requirement as a CTE teacher is they have to have their advisory groups and having a diverse group um, involved in that because that's when those teachers can be educated about all the jobs in that medical field if they are, let's say, a biomed teacher, um, which then they can help work with those kids about, yeah, I know you really like this, but did you realize that there was a, um, you know, kind of the, the biotech side of things, meaning that you're going to go and fix all the machinery? So though you, you don't like the blood and guts, but here's the uh, mechanical side to, to the medical field. And, the electronic, so that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But but we don't know that until even ourselves as adults and teachers and counselors are exposed to it. So making sure that that everyone is exposed to it so they can help support those those kids and help them find that proper pathway. Yeah, so the only thing that I'll add to Chris's question there is that um, you know, one thing that we've created, which has helped is a summer STEM Academy. It's a three week program and it goes from second grade to eighth grade. Um, and this is a way for us to do, uh, to get up for lack of better words, our hooks into these kids at a younger age. And I call it the, the Apple model, like, like cell phone Apple, right? Um, that they, Apple's model is if you can get the device into the hands of a young kid, they will be lifelong Apple users. Well, that's my concept with STEM. And if you can get STEM in front of kids at a young age, they will be lifelong STEMers. And so it's educating them at an early age. And so that has helped us tremendously as far as getting our programs to, to gain not only community support, um, but excitement with our, with our students is when they're a second grader, they do a mission to Mars and they learn 
about how to create rockets and all that kind of stuff. Well, then that works into robotics and computer science and all those pieces as they grow. And so that's just a way to help um, gain more support around that and more interest at a young age. Because our whole goal is to see if we can get, by doing that, does that also allow us to have um, you know, the, the engineering, biomed, and even computer science uh, split as far as gender? Can we change that by introducing this to kids at a younger age then we can get more women in engineering or more women in computer science or more males in the medical field. And so um, uh, we're starting to see some data starting to come out of our district, um, supporting that these programs are actually helping that piece. Uh, Thank you. And thanks, Catherine, for reminding us that uh, the high school and beyond plan is supposed to start in middle school, not just eighth grade. And um, then also the law uh, requires them to be aligned with IEPs. So uh, there's, they're, they're supposed to be starting a little bit earlier, but traditionally, I think they start in the eighth grade. Um, Jason, is this you? <laughs> it can be I can do it sure okay well and I think this this is actually leads really well with the discussion that we just have right uh, about the importance of the high school and beyond plan about aligning it to students needs and and thinking about are we offering those courses that align and, and we've touched on all of those right and so when we talk about the high school and beyond plan it's an excellent way and in fact it's it's a necessary way to really engage with those students and find out what it is that they want and and we've seen lots of examples of that one of the things that um, you know, having a high quality and high fidelity high school and beyond plan is making sure that our students are graduating on time, right? Is making sure that these kids are finishing up in a timely matter and getting out there so they can, you know, get into these careers and get into these colleges to, to be successful and to move on. And the other thing is it, is it can really be a good focal point for optimism, right? We can really get these kids excited about the courses that they're, that they're developing and, um, and they're taking it and getting them some passion and some excitement about what they're wanting to do after high school. I know for a lot of kids, high school feels like, well, I got to take this and I have to take that, right? Well, and that's a really cool thing about CTE and having some career preparedness in there is it's what they, it's hopefully what they want to do, right? And it's, and it's part of their, their desires and their dreams and what they want to be doing moving forward. So it can help them build in that piece of, of, um, of optimism. Yeah, and as Kim just added in the chat, while the high school and beyond plan has to start by eighth grade, it's considered best practice to provide developmentally appropriate um, career and college exploration activities throughout K-12. Thank you. Um, so uh, Kate is asking, is there wording about this in Senate Bill 5030? Does anybody know? Wording about this being the high school and beyond plan. I would need a little Kate, bit more information, Kate. Kate, can you unmute yourself and tell us what you're asking? Uh, yeah, just um, I know it's coming down the line about a comprehensive, uh, you know, kind of career guidance in the um, Senate Bill 5030. I think that's the number okay. for it. But yeah, is there. Um, is there a direct connection with high school and beyond and dual credit, at, for, especially for the middle school? Um, we're just getting into the beginning of implementation planning around that. The main idea for that bill is to support the adoption of standards aligned with the national school counseling model. Um, high school and beyond plan is, is certainly a Washington state sort of homegrown um, career and, and college guidance document for students. So that is an element of a comprehensive school uh, um, counseling plan. So we'll get some more information for you around that. We're likely to stick pretty close to the, to the letter of the law on that bill um, because it's a lot of work without a lot of resource. Um, but I think having deep understanding about how career and college readiness preparation is embedded in K-12 is, is likely part of a comprehensive school counseling program. But no, the bill itself does not call out high school and beyond plans. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we are going to do another poll right now. And uh, 
you're going to use the chat to answer this and it's what does your career exploration look like how does it tie to the high school and beyond plan and you can share that in the chat we'll give you a few minutes to do that and then we'll we'll see what's in there and we'll read some of the uh, some of the answers So Kevin says they use school links. It's their first year of implementation and they're pleased with the platform. Um, Kim, I, I know you're in the audience. Do you mind sharing us with us a little bit about what you shared this morning on the different um, uh, platforms that, uh, you know, that there are 10 different um, programs that OSPI reviewed that and that districts can use just about anything they want? Sure, Bonnie, thanks for the invite. Um, so last spring, OSPI conducted a, a research process essentially that was mandated by the legislature to review the different platforms that are out in the world for alignment with what our state requires in the High School and Beyond Plan. And the list that we uh, created, which I'll put in the chat again for y'all if you wanna take a look, it is not an exhaustive list and it is not a mandated list. So I wanna be clear that schools don't have to use any of the, the 10 different platforms that we basically vetted. Um, but what we did try to do is provide districts with the information about how these different platforms align to state requirements and to give you that as a way of helping you decide what might be the best fit for your district because this year was the school year where it was mandated that districts provide students with access to an online platform. So I will be happy to put that in the chat and uh, you're welcome to follow up with me if you have any specific questions. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks, Kim. Um, I see uh, some middle schools use Career Bridge. Zello is mentioned a couple of times. Career and College Guidance Specialists. Um, they, one school has high school and beyond planning coordinators, um, school links, mm, a career planner, um, and pointing out different careers to kids. Using a career language early in the student experience is really helpful because it plants seeds that are they need to think about. Let it percolate. Um, that's a good one. Um, I think that's about it. We appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Let it percolate. I love that too, Catherine. So what we're going to do is challenge you to discuss your ideas with leadership, share ideas with your PLC, or maybe even lead a discussion with students. And if you have a next step, if this, um, if this presentation gave you an aha moment or the light bulb went off, share with us in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we do have some resources. Um, I think a couple of times and we'll do it again, but we dropped the link to the Me Dual Credit Options website in the chat. It's a great resource for you. We have the OSPI CTE link uh, to their webpage. We have a link to the high school and beyond planning at OSPI. And then we have our implement screen button, which if you need help, you click on the green button. It's a survey, you complete it. Uh, it comes to our office and we will see if we can answer your questions. Uh, uh, System and School Improvement has a monthly digital newsletter that we send out. We archive it on the um, Aussie webpage, and you can go there and read any of our past um, uh, editions. We try to mirror whatever the topic or theme is for the, the gate equity webinars. 
there are uh, policy updates, there's data, they, we have professional development opportunities on it. And if you want to subscribe, we'd be happy to send it to you every month. It, I try to get it out the first of the month. And again, I'm Bonnie Zimmerman, Catherine Mahoney, Jason Boatwright, Samantha Sanders, Doug Edmondson, and Jessica Dempsey. We're here for you if you need help. Uh, these are email addresses. Just email us and we'll see what we can do. I heard Doug and Jessica say more than once to get in touch with them, that they're more than willing to help you and not just willing, but delighted to help you. So instead of the regular poll that we do, I think Megan has dropped a link into the chat. This is our, our survey. Um, it's a little bit lengthier, but as we're planning for next year, we really want to hear from you. Your feedback is what helps drive this webinar, and we will use the information you give us to plan for next year and uh, hope that we can provide you with you know, great webinars like this one today. Um, yeah, this was awesome. And I think it was necessary. Next month is improvement science. And the 101 will be designing empathy interviews and driving equitable supports with a tiered fidelity inf inventory or TFI will be the afternoon webinar. We hope you can join us for that. And we want to thank everybody for coming. We think this was a great webinar. We liked um, hearing from you. We liked being able to answer your questions. And Doug and Jessica, thank you so much. Catherine, Sam, and Jason, um, it was a great, great, great uh, webinar and terrific information. Thank you so much.